Good morning. Good morning. The scripture for today will be coming from Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21. That's Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Elijah. Whoa. <laughs> I'm live today. It's great to be back with all of you today, just being able to worship with you and think about some of the possibilities that are going on. This is really, really great to have two new guys who are coming on staff here. That's going to be just really great. I've met both of them already, spent just a few minutes with them, so I haven't been able to spend a long time with them. But uh, that's just one of those things that this is going to be awesome. Uh, both of these guys are really, really good, and so I'm excited for you to meet them. I think the first one comes in a couple weeks, and so uh, that's really good. Sitting in the airport, I was reading Facebook. Okay, I confess. But uh, I noticed all of a sudden Joel Sumar pops up. Joel Sumar is leading a group to uh, Antigua. And so he's on his mission trip right now. Of course, I didn't see him in the airport and try and hunt him down or anything like that. But uh, they're already still working, and it'll be great to have them here leading in some parts here. Thanks to Chuck for doing the sermon last week. So thank you very much for that. That's always a good thing when you've got people who can fill in. And uh, I'm excited about the people that we've got coming. One of the things that we have done, probably the best thing we have done to promote the church in this community, is being able to work with schools. Uh, it, this is a phenomenal opportunity. You talk to anyone anywhere else and you no, know, churches and schools don't get along, they don't like each other, they don't let you in. But we somehow have managed to have an opportunity to get into schools here. And they are willing to partner with us, to talk to us, the teachers, the, everything seems to be working really well with that. And so coming up soon, we're going to be doing backpacks and teacher bags. And so we need some supplies to put in the backpacks and in the teacher bags. And so I think there's a list that, that we're able to do. And so if you would be able to do that, I know there's a place in the foyer where you can... Uh, bring some of your donations, we'll try and uh, do some promotion again this way to be able to say, you know what, we care about our community, we care about kids, we've got a village, we've got all kinds of things going on. And I know that God's going to bless that in our work. So let's talk a little bit about time today. Uh, in Ecclesiast Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon talks about seasons in life, and he says there's a time for every season. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, we're not going to go into that lesson today and explore that lesson. I wanted to go off of Ephesians 5 and look at what he says here, the one that Elijah's just read to us. And he makes a contrast here between using your time well and the evil that comes. He says, the days are evil. How many evil days do you see? Hopefully you don't see any evil days. But with the recent events, you can see some pretty bad days that are going on for some people around. And I think the person who has no plan and no theory about his time, no idea of what he wants to do, that's what happens. Evil comes in and evil takes over. If you don't have a plan to actually do something good, then evil is going to come in. And you're going to have some bad days. But it doesn't have to be that way. So Paul gives you an overview here of some things that we're able to see about how to use our time. One of the first things is to use it wisely. And he's just going to say, I don't want you to be unwise in your use of time. I want you to be able to use it wisely. Well, what does that mean to use it wisely? Uh, you're the only one that knows what opportunities you have. 
He draws a contrast here with saying, you know, don't get drunk, don't be foolish. Neither one of those are going to help promote anything good in your life. Days are evil, don't be distracted by those things. But there's a reason that you have for doing the things that you do. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of relaxing. That's doing something on purpose so that you can then get busy. So that you're, you're able to work and able to do something else. It's not the same as doing nothing. And so make the best use of your time. I'm not saying 24 hours a day and that that's going to be the most productive, but use it. I understand there's limitations with age. Sometimes you're too young and you can't do enough. Sometimes you're too old and you can't do enough. So you middle guys have really got to step it up here and get busy. I'm getting toward one end of those things and I don't like it. We only have so much time with each person. I recognize that more this time. Uh, grandkids are wonderful. But you only get so much time with them, especially when they live in Florida and you live in uh, Arizona. And we got to see a bunch of friends at a conference. And it was really good to see old friends again and get to talk with them and to realize we don't belong there. We belong here. This is the place where we're supposed to be. This is where things should work. And it's great to see people, but you don't get to keep all the people you know. It would be nice, but you don't get to do that. There's just other places and other things that are needed. And so right now, Arizona is a great place to be because I'm excited about some stuff that we've got that's going to be coming up. So you don't get all the time with your grandchildren. It would be nice to have a little bit more. But, you know, if you had them 24-7, they'd almost be like kids. <laughs> and you don't want that. So, I mean, a little's good. Uh, too much can be too much. I mean, you need to get away from them sometime. And so that's one of the things that happens. So using your time wisely, there is a thing that's called too much. There is something that's too little. Just enjoy the time you've got and enjoy what you're able to do. He talks also about understanding what the will of the Lord is. And that's very significant in our use of time. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Because he's the one that's planned this earth. He's the one that's planned this life. And he's the one that shows us what we do. We can see what God wants. We can understand what God has in store for us. We can see things that God is supposed to be doing around us, and we can get involved in those things. But I think sometimes we end up sitting and waiting for, you know, somebody's supposed to tell me what to do. And it isn't that. It is more this statement of Paul's that I don't want you to sit around and wait for someone to tell you, like the preacher or the elders, and say, you know, if, if I can do anything, just let me know. you gotta, you got to tell me, though, every single step. So if you're trying to build a brick wall and you get the brick started and you put one brick on and put some mortar and, and you need another brick, so would you hand me another brick? And so the person brings you a brick and you put the mortar on and get the brick set just right, tapped in and everything, and you need another brick. You say, would you hand me another brick? And so they give you another brick and you get that brick set and tap it all in just right, and then you look back and you say, would you hand me an... This could go on for a long time, you realize. What should happen there? Seems obvious, right? The person should realize he's going to need another brick. Let me get it ready, pick it up, and hand it to him. You didn't have to say it. And so he says, I want you to understand what we're trying to do. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And then it's not a matter of you being told every single thing that you're supposed to do. Like you're a tiny child. You're an adult. You're grown. You should know these things. You should be able to see, here's what God's trying to do. And so when he says, understand what the will of the Lord is so that you feel effective, you feel involved, you feel like you know what's happening, you can see God at work all around you, and you can say, oh, I, I should pick up another brick. 
I should be able to do this part. And we feel so close to God when that happens because now we're able to be involved. We're able to see how it happens. And I think that's one of those things that is important for us. There are some things that we are supposed to do. But a lot of times what gets said is, well, I think we ought to do, notice the we, ought to, meaning you, ought to do, and you get the suggestion. Not something I saw as important. But then they kind of get upset. No, I think we need to do this. What do you mean we? I think God's showing it to you. And if you feel like that's important, that means God is giving it to you. And we always want to, you know, pass this along. You know, there's a time to pass things along, but not always. And so when you think about it, some things are just for the person that God shows it to do because he has those kinds of things, you realize. Noah is supposed to build an ark. Nehemiah is supposed to build walls. Noah is not supposed to build walls. He's supposed to build an ark. Nehemiah is not supposed to build an ark. He's supposed to build walls. Jonah is supposed to preach to Nineveh. I would have given up a long time ago, but God seems to be saying, no, I want you, Jonah, only you, you are the man, you're going to go. And it's a very complicated story involving big fish and sailing and seas and everything else to get Jonah to go do what he has for him to do. And so if that's what it takes, some of us are slow learners, I guess. But that's what it's supposed to be. There are 12 who are called apostles. There are not more. When one's gone, they pick another one, but it's the 12, and they had a special place. Moses is to lead people out of Egypt into a desert and to walk across. I always wanted to mix the stories up and say, you know, Moses, you should build an ark. Sail those people down the Nile River out into the Mediterranean around to the Promised Land. You'll avoid the desert. Don't you think that'd be good? That's just a little slight change on the plan, but, you know, fill the people not with animals, fill it with people, and you can run all those people, and, but that's not the plan. Moses, only Moses, you are supposed to lead these people. Joshua was supposed to bring them into the promised land, not Moses. So it's only Joshua, and God is with him. Deborah is supposed to lead the people of God when every other man around fails. Sometimes it comes like that. When everybody else around is too scared, too nervous, can't do it, then, yeah, Deborah, you're supposed to do it. Jesus is the one who dies on a cross. Nobody else. It's not up to anybody else. It's for Jesus to die on that cross. And there are times when there are specific things that we are to do, us, that God has specifically for us. Now, there are times when we delegate. There are times when we train. I don't mean you're supposed to do everything, but there is a way in which Jesus shows it's my place to go to the cross, but I'm going to train and disciple other people to come after me so that this work continues. And so, yes, the training is important. The discipling is important. And so that's part of it. But, you know, Jesus can't say, well, I'll train one of you to take my cross for me. No. Jesus goes to the cross. And so it's important to realize that some things are just for us. Number three, be filled with the Spirit. That is significant in your use of time. Because if you are not, you're probably not going to approach life the same way. The difference in a person who is filled with love and joy and peace and patience as he approaches life and as he approaches his use of time is going to be hugely different than a person who's angry and grouchy and upset at everything and wondering why more people aren't involved in doing anything. Your use of time has a lot to do with how you are filled with the Spirit, with how you are led in this way. He talks about how this is not evil, but be filled with the Spirit, not drunk, but be filled with the Spirit in a way that brings out this praise, that brings out this worship, that brings out this 
melody of the heart and it is is expressed in worship not church attendance it is expressed in worship and the worship is what you do after you got here it's a person with love and joy and peace talking to his God and singing to his God and encouraging people around because he loves his God so much and he's filled him with that spirit that there's no room for self and there's no room for evil at all and then that reverence for Christ allows us to submit to each other when you've got all of these, when you know what the will of the God is, when you know how to be wise, when you are filled with his spirit, then that reverence from Christ just allows us to be able to submissive to each other. And he says that's why husbands and wives are able to get along so well, because they've been able to understand their use of time and been able to know how all this works. Because if they don't understand the use of time and they think it's all about them, it's not going to work very well. And so all of these things go into this one thing that says use your time well for God. Because what an incredible life it is to be able to see all of these things. So what does Jesus expect? In Matthew 24, as he's been talking about the end of time and destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus ends the chapter And he says this, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give him their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if the wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, and the master of the servants will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It doesn't sound like a very good place to be. Don't want to end up there. What's the solution? Use time wisely. It's not that difficult. Use time wisely. So how do you use your time? He says, well, I'm going to reward the guy I find doing it. In other words, the guy who could see what God was trying to do around him and then able to go back in and say, all right, I'll go ahead and start. Did anybody tell him what to do? Well, it's kind of obvious what God's doing, right? Just to be able to say, here's what needs to happen. So the wise, faithful servant is the one who starts already. He starts doing those things because time... It's not about intention, it's about action. We only have so much time. You can't get rid of any either. And sometimes I think that's our issue. Yeah, we just don't have enough time for everything. So what are you doing? Well, I'm waiting. What do you mean you're waiting? I'm waiting for time to pass so that I can... Do you realize how much waiting we do? You can't get rid of time. You can't get more time. You only have what you have because God gave you that. And our only action is to be able to use it well. And so that's really what he's trying to get across here is to be able to do those things. He worked, we work for our master. Sometimes people think, well, the best thing is to do what you're told. Not so much. The better thing is to know what the person wants and to do it before you're told that's usually what works best if the wife has to say to the husband every single thing he's supposed to do how's he going to do with that well not very well because we get tired of being told what to do well there's an easy solution for that figure it out do it first that's the easiest way If the husband seems too bossy, like he's always telling her what to do, there's an easy solution for that. Figure out what needs to be done and do it first. You see, when we understand some of these things, it's it's always automatic. How many of you have ever been to a dentist? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't even ask that question, should I? All of you, right? So you go in and you got a cavity get filled and as soon as you go in the person comes in and they there's two of them the dentist comes in you know with a cordless drill 
And the other person comes in and sits on the other side of you with all the torture tools. I mean, they lay out this big tray with all these things that are sitting there and all kinds of sharp-angled things that are there to poke you. And then it's amazing to me. There's no conversation at all. I'm kind of glad because I'd hate for him to say, give me that thing that sticks really hard and, you know, give him that. All right, give me the other one that's even sharper and pokes worse. <laughs> okay, let's, that's enough of that one. Now give me the one that, that really grinds on his teeth and let's use that for a while. All right, put a three-eighths bit in that drill and I'm going to drill out a tooth here. Give me the thing that's extra, extra pokey and it's going to... No, there's no conversation at all. Why? She knows exactly what he needs. And at most, there's going to be, no, give me that one. Because she already knows. We know how to do that. You're not a good employee unless you can anticipate and see what's going to happen. I did construction back 100 years ago. College days, I know. The guy would say, okay, we're going to lay out a wall which meant he had a pencil, I had 300 studs over there. And he would walk along with the top and bottom plate, put a line, put an X, put a line, put an X, put a line, put an X, and he would walk down. It was up to me to bring 300 studs over, lay them on the lines, put them in the right place, move the top plate, get my hammer out. Yeah, I know back in the olden days, we still used hammers. Uh, and start tapping all those things in. After a while, he, he didn't want to have to tell me, would you go get a board and put it here? Get another board and put it here. He didn't even want to tell me, go get boards. All he had to do is, we're laying out a wall. I know what that means. That means you got the pencil, I get to carry 300 boards. You just know what you're supposed to do somehow. And that's the job. That's up to us to be able to figure that out. You do it all day long at your work. Why can't we do it at church? Why can't we do it with God? We know what he wants. We can see it happening all around us. If we, want, if we can't, then why are we so blind? Be able to look and see what's going on. You can see all these things happening. We got two new guys coming. This is going to be great. This is going to be so good to be able to have this type of, of interaction, this type of level of, of worship, this type of level of work. It starts right now with something as simple as wipes for teachers, paper, backpacks, something easy like that. But it makes a huge difference in the outreach of this church, in the community, in people in heaven. And it's just a matter of seeing what needs to be done and getting started on all those things. So to make it easier for you, so I came up with a list. Actually, I found a list. So here's the list to make it very, very practical, all right? You ready? Get stuff done. Think of stuff to do. Do that stuff. Repeat two and three all day. Sleep. Okay? I thought I'd make it real practical for you, all right? So that's the list. That's all you have to do. Do stuff. Think of more stuff. Do that stuff. Do more stuff. Think more. Do more. And then, ah, oh, you're going to need some sleep. I think that's what it's really all about. It's not about how organized we are, but it does take some organization. The principle is use your time for God. Just organization doesn't mean godly. But you know, if you're really ineffective about your organization, that doesn't glorify God either. And I really can't see anywhere where God blesses laziness. And saying, I gave you all this time, you go, yeah, but it's just too much. We just don't want this much. Would you take some back? We're going to sit around and wait. We hate waiting. We all have exactly the same amount. Doesn't matter how much money you have, we have 24 hours. 
every single day. Use it for God. You cannot give any away. You cannot get less. And there is this tension that goes on between the world and God and time is in the middle. And so there's this stuff we need to do. And so we take the world side and we stack all the boxes of work and play and recreation and stuff like that on the, on the world side. And we get a good, we've done a great job with that. And that's really wonderful. And then we look at the God side and, well, there's nothing over here. Well, how about if we put worship over here? It's the tension between the two. It's treasure in heaven that goes on the worship side. It's taking God to work. It's God in your play. It's family and friends that are relationships with God. And I think that's what goes on this side. And then you can see all of that coming along together. It's not giving God your time. It's making your time about God. And that's what makes all the difference for us. A good choice today leads to a better choice tomorrow. And we know this because Jesus did it first. He's the one that acted first. He came to this earth. He did his master's will. He went to a cross. He trained disciples. He said, here's what I want you to do. And so what are we supposed to do? Be disciples. It's not difficult. Be disciples. Tell other people about Jesus and about his cross so that they can be disciples. And it's that simple. Use your time to do that. It's easy. And the more people you run into and the more you're able to tell about Jesus and about what he's done, the better his work is going to go. His kingdom is built. He is established. What a great thing it is to see people who really understand my life belongs to God and I'm making all of my time about God, not just trying to divide it up, split it apart. Well, God, I gave you this much this week. So what does he expect of us? What does he expect of you? You have a choice today. We're only taking part of your morning. The good choice today is going to lead to a better tomorrow, but you have the power to choose. I can't make it for you. I guess I already gave you the list. Do stuff. Choose wisely. And maybe your first choice is decide I need to be right with God. If you haven't done that first step, boy, we want you to do that one first. Make your life right with God. Whether you need to come and repent of things in your life or whether you need to come and be baptized into Christ, do it now. It makes a better tomorrow. Would you come while we stand and sing?